So what else can you do with a coset? To see what you can do, let's go ahead and take a look at a very familiar group, the set of integers with the operation of addition. So let's define nz to be the set of integers nz where z is an integer. And because we're working with the operation of addition, uh, we know that this is a subgroup. You know this is true because it's, uh, well, because you can prove it. Now, let's consider what the cosets of n, z look like. And so the left cosets, my operation is addition. So first of all, my set itself, my subgroup, 5z, looks like, well, minus 5, 0, looks like all the multiples of 5. And my group operation is addition. So I can take something that's not in this set. Well, how about 1? And add it on the left to everything in here. So this is 1 plus 5z, everything in here. I'm going to add 1 to it, and I get my first coset. And I look for something that's in neither of these two. Well, how about 2? Looks like it's not in there, so I'll add 2 to everything in 5, and I'll get this. And likewise, I can find my cosets 3 and 4. Now, one thing that's worth noticing here is, remember, all of our cosets have the same size. I've taken this set z and I've partitioned it into one, two, three, four, five sets of equal size. And part of the process of being a mathematician is looking at something and asking yourself, where have I seen this before? I've taken something and I've broken it up into five sets of equal amount in all of them. Well, this is really looks like a division. And it seems like we've taken this set of integers c and we've somehow divided it by this set of integers 5z. So I've taken this, I've broken it into pieces that all look sort of like this. So it looks like we've done that division. And so our five sets above form our quotient um, uh, Thing. I don't know what to call this right now, but we'll come up with a good name for it later. But it is very similar to what we consider to be a regular quotient. Now, no surprise, as this is, is an abstract algebra course, the question that we do want to ask is, can I make a group out of these things? So I have a bunch of things here. How can I make these into a group? And so let's uh, begin by trying to develop some notation. We want a somewhat more convenient way to represent the subgroup and its coset. So remember our subgroup and the cosets, they were the subgroup 5z and the things that we got by adding an element that wasn't in 5z to them. Now, we might consider that this added element is what's going to distinguish the cosets. Because cosets are either disjoint or identical, once I know what element I'm using here, I can use that to represent the entire coset. So I'll represent this coset with a 1, this with a 2, this with a 3, and so on. Well, actually, that's not really great notation because I am liable to confuse this 1, which is really representing 1 plus 5z, with the integer one. So to avoid confusion, what I'll do is I'll throw these representatives into brackets. Now, consistency counts. What do I do with this thing? Well, I got this thing by, well, I got everything else by something plus. What am I going to do to get 5z? Well, I can add zero to it. And that means the way I can represent the group itself is zero plus, and my group subgroup itself is represented by zero in brackets. So here's my cosets. And using the notation that we have, I can say that the quotient thing, z divided by 5z, gives us this set 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, we're not quite there yet. The problem is that we claim that the only distinct cosets are these, uh, but we can form a coset by adding any element we want to to 5z. So I could talk about a coset like 31, 9, 874 plus 5z. That's going to be this coset. And it's got to be one of these because all of our elements of z ended up in one of these five cosets. But which one is it equal to? And what we want is some easy way of determining when two cosets are equal. Well, we can start at the end. So I want to find that two cosets are the same thing. 
Well, one of our previously proven lemmas or theorems said that if two cosets are the same thing, it's got to be because the element of the one coset is going to be in the other coset. So I know, for example, that P has to be an element of Q because now these two cosets are not disjoint. There is something in both of them. And as soon as there's something in both, we know that the two cosets are equal. So I know that P is in the coset generated by Q. And, well, Q is a set. So remember, we got Q by adding an element of 5z to Q. So Q plus something in 5z is going to be this entire set. So in order for P to be in this set, P has to be Q, our representative, plus something from 5z. And the important thing about that is maybe we're not so comfortable dealing with cosets here because they're kind of new ideas. Maybe even here this still deals us with set, uh, with set operations, and maybe we're not so comfortable with that. But this P, Q, and K, these are all things in the set of integers, so I'm perfectly comfortable working with things like that. In fact, I know I can do some algebra. P minus Q is equal to 5K. Why this choice? Well, we know that we're going to compare P and Q later on. So we want to be able to say, if I know what P and Q are, then I know something else. And I know P minus Q has to be 5K. And what that translates back into is, if I know that P minus Q is a multiple of 5, then I have this first line, and I can proceed straight to the end. Now, it's a good habit to get into to add some notes to make sure you can actually take these steps. So let's see. P minus Q equals 5K. Well, I am assuming that P minus Q is a multiple of 5, and so that says, by definition, P minus Q has to be 5 times something. I can do a little bit of algebra, make sure that this is actually algebra in the integers. We're allowed to do that. P, Q, and K, these are all integers, so we're allowed to do that. Our definition of what this coset is, is it's Q plus some multiple of 5. Well, that's Q plus some multiple of 5, so that says P has to be in our coset. And we have our lemma about disjoint cosets, guaranteeing that once I have a single thing in there, I have everything else in there. Once you let the camel's nose into the tent, the rest of the camel shows up. Now, if you want to be a good mathematician, one of the things that you also look for is any time you can re use a set of steps. And in particular, because we started at the end and worked our way backwards, and then worked our way forwards to actually complete the proof, because we worked our way backwards the first time, we can actually reverse the proof steps. So that tells me, suppose I know two cosets are equal, then I know that P is an element of the second coset, and I can get the similar result to what I started with, as a conclusion. So what does that mean? Well, I start here, P minus Q is a multiple of 5. I end here, the cosets are the same. Or I start with the cosets are the same. I know that P minus Q is a multiple of 5. This is an if and only if proof. I start here, I end there. I start where I ended, I go back to the beginning. Because I can prove both sides of the conditional, I actually now have an if and only if proof. I get the converse. And so that gives me the following nice lemma, which is that if I know that P and Q are left or right cosets of Z mod Zn, then I know that they are equal if and only if their difference is a multiple of whatever n is. And so far, so good. What that means is I now have a way of being able to compare two cosets. Now, what do I need? Well, my cosets are elements, but I do need that binary operation. So if I can introduce a binary operation, I can form a group. Well, here's where things get a little bit complicated, because introducing that binary operation does involve us in some complexities. But the good news is that gives us a way of doing more mathematics. So let's take a look at that in the next video.